It's good to see everybody this evening. Hope everybody's doing good. Uh, if you'll turn to page 176. 176. 76. Fairest Lord Jesus. Good evening. Good evening. That's better. Yes, I was late getting up to the sanctuary tonight. It was completely, totally, 1,000% the deacon's fault. <laughs> Specifically Stan Elkins. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, hope you've had a good day and uh, hope we've going to have a good time here tonight in the Lord. I know we've got a good passage to look at tonight. Uh, we'll take some prayer requests later on, as we always do on uh, Wednesday nights, and give some updates on some folks, and um, that's always an important ministry, but uh, right now let's open up with a word of prayer, okay? Father, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here one more time tonight. We ask your blessing upon tonight's service. Help me to preach as you would have me to preach. I don't take this lightly at all. 
and I have studied and tried to put together what I feel like you want me to say from this passage, and so help me now to share it with these good folks here this evening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the blessings that brought us this way. We, we all are just so blessed. We have food in our stomachs. We have good clothes to wear. We have nice cars to drive. We have good homes that we live in. We have health enough to get us here on a Wednesday night. And that is a, a long list there that puts us far above a lot of people in this world. And we need to be appreciative of that. And, of course, all this is in addition to Jesus and the fact that we know him as Savior and we have all the spiritual blessings that go along with the material blessings. So it's really a package deal, and we're grateful for that as well, the fact that we as Christians know that our sins are forgiven, that Jesus died on the cross in payment for those sins. And if we believe in him as our Savior, the Bible tells us that we can be forgiven of all of our sins and we can be made right in the eyes of God and we can be assured heaven. And these are all such wonderful promises that we just live in every day as Christians. We have that great hope of the, the, the future. Uh, we were talking about that hope with the, this funeral this past week and just what a wonderful blessing it is to know that no matter how bad this life gets, uh, we know our destination in the next one, and that's all because of Christ. So we're meeting tonight in his name as his people. Later on, as we take our prayer requests, Lord, lead and guide and direct us through all that. And again, help me to preach tonight as you'd have me to preach. Thank you for these that have come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, you ought to know kind of where we're at by now, Second Samuel chapter 7. I bet some of you have been cheating and reading ahead. And you do that and you wonder, well, what will Russell pull out of that, do you reckon? So you'll find out tonight, Second Samuel chapter 7. And we're going to look at the first 17 verses of this chapter, actually read the first 17 verses. D.L. Moody was one of the most famous preachers who ever lived. You've probably heard of him. You've heard me quote him, I guess. And he used to pray a prayer that went like this. Lord, if what I ask for does not please you, neither would it please me. My desires are put into your hands to be corrected. Strike the pen through every petition that I offer that is not right, and put in whatever I have omitted, even though I might not have desired it, had I considered it, unquote. I wanted to read that prayer to you here as we come to this story because we've come to a place in David's life where we find God doing that exact kind of thing that D.O. Moody describes there, in his prayer, David has a desire, a vision to do something. But when that desire, that vision is submitted to God, God strikes the pen through it and says, no. And in its place, God reveals his will to David. And that will turns out to be something that even David himself would not have dared ask for. And I've entitled uh, tonight's message, When God Says No. I don't know about you, but there have been plenty of times in my life and in my walk with the Lord, more than I can recall, when I really wanted a certain thing. And I prayed and I asked God to do that certain thing, to provide that certain thing. But the more I talked with God, with Him talking back to to me, by way of the indwelling Holy Spirit who dwells within each Christian, he told me, no, no, I, I don't want you to do that. I, I'm not agreeing to that. That's not my will for your life. And as we work our way through this story tonight, we're going to find David hitting one of those no's. And as we look at this story, I want to share three facts with you 
about when God says no. Okay? Now, fact number one is this. God can say no to some seemingly worthy requests. God can say no to some seemingly worthy requests. Look at verses 1 and 2 here as we get into this passage. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Now, back in chapter 5, we read that after David and his army took the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, a man named Hiram, who was a king, uh, the king in the uh, Phoenician city of Tyre, Hiram sent materials and workers to Jerusalem and built David a fine house of cedar. You might think of that as the palace or whatever you want to call it, but it was David's house. But once David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, which we've been talking about, it doesn't take him long to begin to feel bad about the fact that the Ark is not being housed in a structure on par with his house. David thinks, here I am in this beautiful house, The ark needs to be in a more beautiful structure than I'm living in. Now, up until this point in Israel's history, the ark had always been kept in the innermost room, the the so-called Holy of Holies of Israel's tabernacle. And I might do a study here one of these days on the tabernacle. It's, It's a major, major Bible study. When, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai there and God gave him not only the Ten Commandments but the whole body of law for Israel to live by, part of that was God said, I want you to build the tabernacle. And, of course, also that involved the building of the Ark of the Covenant itself. But uh, the tabernacle, if you can think of it this way, it was a portable a tent-like complex that wherever the people of Israel moved, it would move with them. They'd take it down and put it up. And the ark has always been there. But when David brings the ark into Jerusalem, the tabernacle kind of fades off of the main scene of Israel. And David places the ark in this special tent that he has erected there in Jerusalem to house it. And it's that tent that he's referring to when he tells the prophet Nathan, the ark of God dwells within or behind curtains. So it's obvious what David wants to do here. He wants to build this big, beautiful, magnificent temple in which the ark will be kept. And let's just say that was a very noble, worthy idea. That's the kind of thing a guy like David should be thinking as he's sitting there just sort of mulling over uh, what's going on in his kingdom. David is thinking on a very lofty plane here. And the prophet Nathan understands this. Uh, So look at verse 3, verse 3. And Nathan said unto the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Now, this is our formal introduction here in this passage um, to Nathan. Up until now, the prophet in David's inner circle has been a guy named Gad. And uh, we met him back in 1 Samuel chapter 22. But from here on out, Nathan will serve as the primary prophetic voice for David's reign. He he was a great man of God. Nathan is a a wonderful Bible character. As a matter of fact, David came to hold him in such high regard that 1 Chronicles 3 verses 1 through 5 tell us that David actually named one of his sons Nathan. So that's how highly he thought of Nathan. And, of course, it was good that David got a prophet's opinion concerning what he wanted to do here. It's always good to talk to the preacher. Amen? Not one. Not one. Amen. Wow. So, on the surface, there seemed to be absolutely nothing wrong with David building this temple. And Nathan's just knee-jerk reaction. It's not like he had prayed about it or anything. He just said, sure, sounds good to me. You're God's anointed king. Uh, His hand of favor is upon your life. Go. Go do what you're planning to do. But now look at verses uh, 4, and let's go ahead and read down through verse 7. 
And it came to pass, or it happened that night, that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house uh, to dwell in, a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle, in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? So God corrects Nathan's thinking here. <laughs> he basically says, uh, Nathan, you misspoke there earlier today. You, you didn't do it sinfully because I hadn't told you, but I'm telling you now. This is information that you need, and you need to relay it to David. And what God basically says is, in all this time since I brought Israel out of Egypt through the Exodus, have I ever told any of the 12 tribes, I really would like for you to build me a house of cedar, a temple for me? Uh, God says, uh, I have uh, been content just to dwell in a in, uh, walk, as the King James puts it, in a tent and in a tabernacle. And remember, by the way, that the way the people of Israel thought, God dwelt at the mercy seat there on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. I, I've told you before that on one end of the mercy seat you had that angel that had been crafted and the wings came up here. And then at the other end you had the other angel, just a, a mirror image, and the wings came up here. And that level spot there was sort of a mercy seat is what it was called and God said I will meet with you there so that's the idea here so he says I haven't requested a temple I haven't requested uh, any kind of house to be built uh, so God is already setting up the no now again there was nothing wrong with a request as a matter of fact in 1 Kings 8.18, God uh, tells us, uh, or the Bible tells us rather, that later on God actually told David, you did well that building the temple was in your heart. So, so it's not that David's request is, is uh, terrible or it's a bad idea, but God says no. Uh, and that teaches us something, folks, and it's this. The fact that uh, your motivation for wanting to do a thing is right that doesn't mean that God automatically is going to sign off on it and say, sure, go do that. See, that's the point we're making here. God can say no to some seemingly worthy requests. I think about that uh, wild man who lived in the cemetery of Gadara. You remember that story, don't you? That demon-possessed man. And his body was just, just filled with demons. And uh, we're talking about a worst-case scenario there of demon possession. So Jesus... And the 12, they get off the boat, and the guy comes running up to them, and, and you're, you're right there in the middle of a Bible story. And the man is just, he's just crazy. He's a lunatic. He's up in the, the uh, cemetery, the graveyard all the time, cutting himself with sharp rocks and all this kind of thing. And you know how that story plays out. Jesus cast those demons out into that herd of swine, and the swine run down the hill, and they drown uh, there in the Sea of Galilee and all of that kind of thing. And after that, the man is uh, fine. And they get him some clothes there somewhere. And, and so the whole townspeople, or, or the whole town, the people of the town come out to see him. And he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And it just throws this major scare into all of them. And they tell Jesus, leave. Which gives you an indication of where they were spiritually. So Jesus and, and the uh, apostles say, okay. And they're getting in the, the uh, boat to go back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And the man says to Jesus, I'm going with you. Take me with you. And by the way, I never blame him when I read that story because the guy that just cured him, they're kicking out of the territory. I would want to go with him too, you know. I wouldn't want to go back to that bunch. But Jesus looks at him and says, no. He says, go home to your friends and tell them all about the great things the Lord has done for you. In other words, I need you witnessing for me here. I need you influencing the people you know. I need you to be my witness to your friends. Uh, 
the 12 and I, we're going. We're going to do other things, but we're not going to be here ministering. I'm leaving you here to do it. So that, that's a no. And God can say no, but somebody might say, well, what could possibly be wrong with wanting to go join the ministry team and be with Jesus? Nothing's wrong with it unless the Lord says no. One preacher put it this way, many things in life are perfectly acceptable until they get on a God-forbidden tree. See, that's what happened with David. Building a temple for God, great. That's an acceptable kind of thing. But for David, God put it on a God-forbidden tree and said, no, I don't want you doing that. Okay. Now, fact number two about when God says no is this. When God says no, he has a reason for it. Now, this chapter here in 2 Samuel, that's the one I'm going with because that's, we've been kind of following this uh, storyline through 2 Samuel, so I'll just pick this chapter but uh, this chapter is lacking in one very important detail, and that is it doesn't tell us why God didn't want David to build the temple. But there's another passage, and I'm not going to turn us to it, but I, this is just for your homework. It's First Chronicles chapter 22, and in that chapter we're told why God didn't want him to build the temple. And let me just read those verses to you here, First Chronicles 22, verses 7 and 8. Just sit and listen. This is uh, years later when David is thinking back and talking to his son Solomon about how it all went down. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. The fact is, David was more a warrior than a builder. Uh, by contrast, in the very next verse from that passage, 1 Chronicles 22, 9, David adds in that God also told him at that time that a son would be born to him, a son whom God would give peace and quietness in Israel during the days of his uh, uh, time. So that son would be Solomon. So that was one reason why God said no to David building the temple. And this teaches us, now listen to me here because you might need this. There can be certain things that we do in life that disqualify us from doing certain things in God's will. I know that's kind of a downer point, but it's a Bible truth. That's a whole sermon in and of itself, and I don't have time to preach it tonight. But uh, it's what got David. It's why he couldn't build the temple, one of the reasons. God said, you've shed too much blood. And, of course, we've talked in this series a lot about all the bloodshed that he did uh, shed, uh, that he did uh, do. I once heard a preacher say, I was listening to a guy preach, and he was a pastor, the pastor of a pretty prominent church. He was not a nobody in the ministry. And he said this, he, he, he was talking about his son. And he said, he will do more for the Lord than I ever have because he doesn't have the blood on his hands that I do. And you have no idea how much I wanted that man to explain what he meant by that. <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> he just left it there. But obviously he was referencing this story right here so in God's eyes David was disqualified from building the temple because he had shed too much blood there was another reason though and again it's not mentioned here in, in our passage this one is in 1st Kings chapter 5 verses 1 2 and 3 so let me give you this one too uh, Solomon is is doing the talking now and he's reigning in King David's place and he's actually talking to King Hiram of Tyre that same guy and he says, you know that David, my father, could not build a house unto the Lord his God because of the wars which were all around him on every side, armies the Lord hadn't yet put under Israel's feet. So that's another reason why God didn't let David build the temple. The timing wasn't right. 
for that kind of thing to happen in Jerusalem. The whole territory was still somewhat unsettled. Um, Israel had not been taken from the Jebusites uh, all that long ago. And, and Israel's uh, hold on the city wasn't as good as it could have been, even though everything was fine. Uh, and so this was just more evidence of the fact that when God says no, he has a reason for doing it. God doesn't just tell you no to, to be yanking your chain. He doesn't just tell you no because he hates you. He's mad at you. It doesn't work that way. In, in the case of him saying no to David, uh, the reason was twofold. On the spiritual side of things, David, you've shed too much bloodshed. Uh, you, you just... Too much blood has, has been the result of your sword. You can't do it. And then on the practical side of things, Israel's hold over the city of Jerusalem wasn't quite as secure yet as it needed to be long term in order to erect a temple like that in the city. So when God tells you no, he has a reason for doing it. And can I just say this? That will take a lot of trust on your part especially if he doesn't tell you why he's saying no. And he doesn't always do that. He did with David. But I've had God tell me no sometimes, and I didn't really get a full explanation. It was just no and move on. And then later on, then you might get the, the answer you, you needed as it becomes obvious, oh, well, thank you, Lord. I understand now why you said no back there. But uh, it, it takes faith, it takes trust, and, and you have to say, okay, God, I, I don't understand why you're saying no, but I'm going to stick with you, and I'm going to go with it. And uh, so that's what David does. And that brings us to the third and last fact about when God says no. And don't get too encouraged by that, because this is a pretty long part of it. Um, fact number one was, <laughs> God can say no to some seemingly worthy requests. Fact number two, when God says no, he has a reason for it. Now, fact number three, when God says no, he has something better in mind. Look at verses 8 and 9. God is still talking to Nathan the prophet. He's telling him, you say this to David. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men who are in the earth. God's just retracing here his history with David. He's done all these things for David. Now verses 10 and 11. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own. And move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Now I'm going to pause right there. Because I need to uh, just point out that again God is retracing here. All that he's done and he's going to do for the nation of Israel. But now look at the very last part of verse 11. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Now, I can't tell you how incredibly important this is here. This is God creating what scholars call the Davidic Covenant. And what it means is David is going to begin a dynasty of kings. There will always be, from here on out, one of David's on the throne of Israel. And, and you see the word play here as God talks about this, this kingly line as a house. And we still use the word that way today. The house of Windsor is Great Britain's line of royalty. So God says, Nathan, you tell David that even though I'm not going to, to uh, let him build me a house, I'm going to build him one. It's a different type of house, but I'm going to build it. Uh, and, and so what we see here, this is when the Davidic covenant begins. It 
does tie in with the Abrahamic covenant, which is another covenant. But this is the most important thing in the passage. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a more practical application by calling this sermon when God says no, and that's been kind of my central theme. But you go to any commentary or ask any biblical scholar what's the most important part of this chapter, and they'll tell you it's the Davidic covenant. As a matter of fact, I have two or three times in listening to John MacArthur preach, I've heard him tell a story of when he was in seminary and he was assigned this passage and he had to do his uh, dissertation on it, his sermon, whatever you want to call it. And he was going to be judged by the uh, professor. And so he works and he works and he works, John MacArthur does, and he studies this passage and he, and he, and he puts it all together, writes this great dissertation, and he gets up and he, he uh, pretty much, I can't remember if it was a dissertation or a sermon, but he gets up and he speaks it, he reads it, and all that kind of thing. And uh, so then he's supposed to be judged on uh, how he did by the uh, professor. And, and the professor did it by way of a little note, a little folded up note. So after the class, he hands it to John MacArthur, and John MacArthur is excited, you know, and he opens up the note. He's had all these great points and all these great illustrations and everything, and the note had one line on it. Do you know what it said? You missed the point of the passage completely. <laughs> and it was because John MacArthur did not mention the Davidic covenant. He got all caught up in the prayer requests and, and, and David and the bloodshed and all that kind of thing, and he missed completely the whole thing about God said, I'm going to build you a house. So I, don't, I want to be sure not to miss the point completely tonight. So look at verse 12 now. And when thy days be fulfilled, this is, this is what you tell David, Nathan, and, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. God's talking about Solomon here, who would follow David on the throne. Verse 13 now, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There's going to be a temple built. He'll build it, David. He'll build it. Now verse 14, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now if you know the story of Solomon, he did commit iniquity. He did. And God did chasten him. Uh, in particular, Solomon fell headlong into the sin of idolatry as all those wives and concubines that he had, many of them were just political alliances, marriages for political reasons. But uh, they all had their uh, foreign gods they worshipped, their false gods, and they got Solomon into all that. And he ended up building uh, places for, for them to worship their false gods and shrines and idols and all that kind of thing. And Solomon really fell a long way over the course of his reign. He fell hard into idolatry. And God penalized him for it. Uh, one way God did that was Solomon's uh, heir, his son, David's grandson, Rehoboam. When Solomon died, the, the 12 tribes were still united as David had united them. But when Solomon died and, and Rehoboam took the throne, it wasn't long before the 10 northern tribes broke away and created the northern kingdom of Israel and left uh, the two southern tribes to be the southern kingdom of, of Israel, which was called Judah. But uh, that was sort of a judgment because Solomon had kind of set all that up. See, what happened was... Solomon uh, raised taxes very high to pay for his building projects and all of his expansion. And uh, he, he was pretty tough on the people of the northern kingdom. And so when he died, they came to Rehoboam and said, we need you to lighten up. We need you to lighten up from what your father's been doing. And Rehoboam very foolishly said, if you think my dad was bad, wait till you get a load of me. <laughs> and so they said, we're out of here. And they elected a guy named Jeroboam uh, to be their king. So that was judgment, though, for Solomon. And that's exactly what God had told David. He said, if he, if he commits iniquity, I'll punish him. I'll punish him. And, and it happened. Um, verse 15 now. This is very important, verse 15. But my mercy shall not depart from him. That's Solomon, whom I 
put a, uh, of whom as, as it did whom I put away before thee. Mess my notes up there a little bit. But he's talking there about Saul. God says, um, I took Saul off the throne. And the reason he did it was because Saul had gone bad. Well, Solomon went bad, but God said, I won't take him off the throne. But notice God said, I won't take him off the throne because of you, David. And all you dads in here, can I just say something? You can build a lot of credit with God for your children, if you will. Okay? Now, they're going to have to do their own business with God. You understand that. But you can build a lot of good credit for them with God if you will. And that's what David did. So God said, I will not take my mercy from him, no matter what Solomon does, because of you, like I did the one before you, Saul. And, and so no matter how much Solomon or, frankly, any of the other kings from David's royal line sinned, uh, God would never remove that line, David's line, from Israel's throne the way he removed Saul's line. Never. And now we close our reading tonight with verses 16, 16 and 17. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. So the something better God had in mind was, David, you're going to be the king of a royal dynasty that will rule over Israel forever. Uh, your line will always be on the throne of Israel. So that's the covenant that God established with him. Now, listen, folks, some of those, some of the elements of that covenant, they were fulfilled in Solomon and in Rehoboam, and in on down the line, the kings of Judah. But ultimately, all of the aspects of it would be fulfilled by only one man. You know, Jesus Christ. You see, in a worldly sense, David's line of descendants sitting upon Israel's throne ended with King Zedekiah in 586 B.C., when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and they deported the people to Babylon and all that kind of thing. And ultimately, even though uh, the, the Persians defeated the Babylonians and the Persians and all this happened over a lot of decades, but the Persians allowed the people to go back, uh, the Jews allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. They did go back and they rebuilt the walls of the city and they rebuilt the temple and, and they rebuilt the priesthood uh, as a remnant went back. Most stayed in Babylon. But a remnant went back and did all that. But what they never got back to was having a king after all that. So that's why when you get into the New Testament, and, and by then uh, they're under the rule of the Romans, there's no king in Israel. The Romans rule. Uh, really, Zedekiah was the last in David's line to rule in that way. But here's the thing. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, we read that Jesus was a biological earthly descendant of David. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says he was the son of David. And when the angel Gabriel talked to Mary about her son Jesus, he says in Luke 1.32 and 33, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And you know what? Even in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation twenty two sixteen. Jesus calls himself the offspring of David. And that's literal, biological. He was in that line in an earthly sense. And of course, in a, a messianic sense, he's the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that God made with David. So this Davidic covenant isn't just some ancient type of deal that, that has no bearing upon today or in the future. No, no. Jesus is the fulfillment, and he will always be on the throne of Israel. And, of course, I could get into a lot about the kingdom age and, and all that kind of thing, but my time's gone tonight. But uh, this is where this is all headed. Now, in closing, to get back to my main thing, has God told you no lately? If he has, can I give you a little bit of... Uh, 
personal advice. Don't try to badger him into a yes. He is more stubborn than you are. I'm pretty stubborn, and I can't make a dent in him. Uh, I've tried. Just go with it. Okay, Lord, you know best. Okay, you must have something better in mind. And if you'll learn to operate with him like that when you make your request, then he'll be able to bless you in, in unexpected ways, just like he blessed David in a completely unexpected way. And it'll all turn out better, not only for you, but for your family. So I don't know what you've been asking God for. But if you've been asking him for something to happen for a long, long time, and it just hasn't happened, here's what I would encourage you to do. And I've literally done this in my own prayer times every now and then. Just get to a point with it where you say, Lord, I've been praying about this for a long time. And I've been asking you to do this for a long time long time and it's not happened so I need to know do you want me to keep on making this request is this just a matter of waiting is this a matter of your delay is not your denial is that what's happening here or Lord are you saying no and I'm just not hearing you pray that and say, show me whether you want me to keep making this request or whether you want me to file it away as a no and let it go. And he will. He will. And if he gives you a piece about hanging in there with it, you keep making it because some requests only come and only get answered at the end of a long time of waiting. But if he tells you, thank you for asking. I've been saying no for years on that. And you haven't been listening then stop making that request. It's, it's that simple. It really is. And I don't know which way it'll fall with you. Uh, there have been times in my life when God said, no, keep on doing that. It's just not happened yet, but it's going to happen. Just not my, my timing yet. But there have been other times when he said, no, you're wasting your breath. Don't, don't say that anymore. Don't request that anymore. And to David's credit, after God told him, no, you won't be the one to build the temple. He never tried to build the temple. Now as he got older. And he was looking at Solomon coming on the scene. And he was trying to get everything set up for Solomon. David accumulated a lot of the materials to build the temple. He did that. I mean really. When Solomon was ready to build the temple. And it was God's timing. David had everything in place. It was all ready to go. But David, you don't read any record of him ever again saying, Lord, can we revisit that temple thing? I'd really like to do that. No. What you find him is saying, thank you, Lord, for these awesome promises you've made to me. And he just goes with it. So I don't know where this finds you tonight. Uh, don't know what you're asking for. But if God says no, just know. He can say no to some worthy requests. Just because he says no doesn't mean you were foolish for asking or it's a crazy request. might be a fine request, but he said no. Number two, um, if he says no, he has his reasons. And number three, if he says no, he has something better in mind for you. Just roll with him and let him do that. All right, we'll stop there tonight. Um, hope that was a help to you. And if anybody asks,